Day. I would just like to say, maybe on behalf of everybody, certainly on behalf of me, how grateful I am to him. If I had not met him uh, when I was a graduate student in graduate school, I I think there's a fair chance I wouldn't be doing mathematics today, but when I met Bob, <laughs> I thought, oh my goodness, this is what, I'll, this is what I got to do. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, sort of in a broader sense, uh, what Bob has uh, contributed to mathematics, it's almost, uh, uh, not, it's almost like a motive, uh, what, what, he, what he's, <laughs> in a very broad sense, it, 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 that somehow fundamental ideas, beautiful ideas in art, in, 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 in um, uh, science, and in mathematics. Um, maybe, you're, uh, uh, maybe you're a little bit like motives to human oh, existence. Like motives, some are doubtful. <laughs> <laughs> well, that may be. Uh, 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 in any case, I, I just uh, say that I and I think uh, everybody are profoundly grateful to Bob for what he has contributed uh, to mathematics, and we wish him a very happy 80th birthday, which I gather is coming up in a week. I would also like to. <laughs> I would also like to thank the organizers, Bill Castleman, and Peter. Peter Sarnak, for uh, a wonderful idea for this conference, and um, um, I have enjoyed it very much. And uh, it has seen, seen it's it's uh, just a two little day conference is is very nice. Actually. Peter and I are certainly grateful that people showed up and gave great talks. So. Well, don't don't count your chickens before they're hatched. <laughs> 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 so I'm going to talk um, on actually, as it as it happens, a conjectural, uh, just conjectural uh, answer to what Yasmin mentioned uh, at the end of her talk, uh, primarily for the groups, general linear groups. Um, um, so um, actually. Uh, I, when I was preparing this, I wasn't sure whether vast hordes of people were going to show up and I should say something about functoriality, but I won't do that. Everybody here knows what functoriality is. So I'm going to, actually this, I, I'm going to um, retrace a little bit some of the steps that Altug took. And um, I, I'm going to primarily consider the case GLN, or I'll say, let's say G is equal to GLN plus one. And following uh, Langlands, by the way, there's several papers I'm going to sort of re be referring to often without quoting. There's Bob's paper on beyond endoscopy, possibly with a couple of other papers. There are three papers of Altug. Um, uh, the first one, primarily, I'll be referring to. And uh, there's the paper of uh, uh, um, Chiu, Chiao. Uh, Frankel and Bob, uh, which is in the Quebec Journal of Mathematics. Those, those papers are really, those three of those papers I will refer to uh, be using often without uh, qu quotation. All right, so I, following uh, uh, Bob's paper and also Altug's paper, I'm going to just fix the split, uh, a piece of the center, the, the connected part of the real points in the center. Um, this is of the group GLN, and I'm going to take F to be a smooth function of compact support modulo this S plus. So uh, I want to talk about using the trace formula. This is about uh, Bob's uh, strategy, which was put forward um, um, around the year 2000 for using the trace formula, actually combining the trace formula, which had been used a lot before that, with automorphic L functions, putting the two together somehow to make a fundamental attack, to make an attack on the principle of functoriality. Now, um, uh, nobody, I, I think it's fair to say that the, all of the terms in the trace formula have not been subjected to the kind of analysis that they need to be uh, subjected to. But I'll just remind you that the full tra trace formula is a, uh, uh, an identity between a geometric expansion, all of whose terms I won't elucidate, and a spectral expansion.
Um, but I guess we could call what I what we could call the primary terms uh, in each of those two expansions um, is what I'm going to consider uh, on the geometric side. There uh, is the uh, uh, regular elliptic uh, terms. So I'm going to say uh, that this uh, the, this is equal to the, perhaps the primary term, uh, the the elliptic regular term, plus uh, supplementary. Uh, geometric terms, which I'm going to really not talk about, and um, a primary spectral term. Uh, excuse me, a primary spectral term. Uh, it's the term uh, on the spectral side. It's the term with respect to whatever measure the full uh, arises in the various uh, other spectral terms. It's the one which is discrete, the discrete part of, of the spectral measure for which there's an explicit formula um, plus supplementary spectral terms. So I am going to pretend, well let me just recall what these are, uh, the elliptic uh, regular terms. Um, the sum over elliptic regular conjugacy classes in GQ. Uh, there's a volume term on the geometric side. And there's an orbital integral of this test function f there. So an orbital integral of f at gamma. So I'll just recall that these are the, uh, these are the regular elliptic Conjugacy classes. This is GLN, so oh, we're not sure. we're not yes I, we won't get into the stable trace formula for this. So these are the regular elliptic uh, conjugacy classes in GQ. Uh, this is uh, the volume. I'm not going to uh, be specific about measures. This is the volume of uh, G gamma Q modulo this uh, infinite central subgroup, um, a G a gamma A. And this thing is uh, the just the usual orbital integral, G A modulo G gamma of A of f of x to the minus 1 gamma x dx. So it's a linear combination of uh, orbital integrals with respect to the invariant measures on the conjugacy classes with some um, what turn out to be rather problematical uh, coefficients, the Tamagawa numbers of their centralizers, which in the case of GLN are uh, elliptic tori, uh, in fact multiplicative uh, groups of uh, extensions of uh, degree n of the rational field that we're considering. Uh, on the spectral side, this is a little bit more complicated, but it's nice that uh, it's a little more complicated because it has explicit and, and quite uh, agreeable formulas. It's a sum, it's, it's a bit bigger than just, as, as I recall, it's a bit bigger than just the trace of f on the discrete spectrum of L2 uh, of GA mod GQ. Um, there are some um, uh, extra terms in it that are basically uh, leftovers from having to truncate uh, on the spectral side the Eisenstein part. And uh, so this is a sum, so let me just write it out first. It's a sum over m. Uh, these are Levy, uh, maybe I don't need to write this out. These are Levy components. These are <coughs> conjugacy classes of Levy subgroups of G. This is the corresponding vial group as a normalizing factor. It's a sum over regular elements in this vial group. And regular means that the determinant of W minus 1 is going to be non-zero. So its uh, inverse is what appears there. And then there is a trace uh, of an intertwining operator, MPW, a standard normalized global intertwining operator, um, composed with uh, the in, an, an induced representation 
from a parabolic subgroup with Levy component M. Um, and what is this? This is the uh, induced representation um, from uh, the discrete spectrum. Um, so this is the usual parabolic induced representation um, of a representation of M, this Levy component, namely the, the discrete part of the spectrum of with the uh, relevant central subgroup of, fine, of infinite volume modded out, MQ, MA. So it's, it's uh, induced, this is uh, the induced, parabolically induced representation of G from this rep representation of M, the discrete spectrum. So this, is, this is not invariant. Sorry? It's not conjugacy invariant. No, I'm talking, I'm, I'm inducing the representation. This is, an induced, this is the induced character up to G. It's a character. Yeah, it's, a, it's the usual thing. Okay. Um, so um, I just remind you that when M is equal to G, by definition, this is the discrete spectrum on G, and these other terms are, are little residual, well, no pun intended, but they're leftovers from having to uh, truncate the Eisenstein series and um, uh, get a convergent integral. It's a character. It's a character. Trace. No, but it's got the MPW. It, it's, an intertwining it's an intertwining operator. Oh, it's, 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 I'm sorry. I'm and we're also dealing with GLN, and yeah, it's yeah, a scalar, so its sign is relevant, but it's a scalar. Yeah. So now let me note, um, <laughs> just for future reference, that um, if I were to write this. If I were to write this discrete part of the trace formula out as a linear combination of irreducible characters, let's say a sum over pi, let, let me just call it the representations uh, a pi discrete of G with certain multiplicities, trace pi of f. And so these would be the irreducible representations that support uh, this uh, linear combination of characters. Uh, then there's going to be some interesting smaller sets of irreducible representations. We've got the cuspidal automorphic representations. Um, these are the ones that uh, are, uh, occur in L2 cusp, cuspidal discrete spectrum. These are contained in the uh, I'm going to, I've used the symbol discrete, I uh, hope not confusingly, for this discrete part of the trace formula, but not ones that occur discretely in L2 of G. So I'll use 2 for square integrable, pi 2 of G. So this occurs in the discrete part of the actual spectrum, L2 discrete. And these are contained in, well, in these ones pi discrete of G. And these are just, in general, these are just contained in all of L2. So uh, the difference between these things are what's relevant to the, what I want to consider, and in fact, uh, the problem that Yasmin mentioned um, at the end of her talk. So just in very general terms, Langland's proposal, I won't uh, alley uh, actually described a little bit the kind of estimates uh, that you want to prove ultimately in uh, carrying this out. But just in very general terms, this is Langland's proposal. Given a representation R of the L group, so I'm dealing with GLN, the G hat is GLNC, so this is into a larger general linear group. Um, try to identify um, the contribution. So that would be the geo. So what I'm doing is I'm pretending. Uh, this is an approximation. Um, I'm pretending that the trace formula says that I discrete 
is equal to I regular elliptic. I'm pretending the supplementary terms don't exist, that's not warranted in general, but we have to try to understand these primary terms before we can go on to the others. And so try to understand, try to identify the contribution to the, the geometric contribution, in other words, to regular elliptic, the part of f, this sum here, um, of those representations Well, Langland's proposal is uh, as a proposal for representations applies only to cuspidal representations. They're the ones, they're the fundamental ones, and they're the ones um, that uh, are really the ones, the only ones you can consider applying these ideas to. So try to identify the contribution of those representations in pi cusp of g. Okay, these are these ones, the smallest set. Well, it's still a pretty big set, but the ones that are, are the really fundamental ones. Um, try to identify the contribution to this. We got an identity, so the trace of these things somehow should be a part of this. Um, has a pole at um, s equals 1. <coughs> So that's in very general terms. But you can't even countenance doing that, as was pointed out uh, forcefully in. Yes, I forgot the yeah. yeah, function, such that um, L, of, uh, uh, L of S, pi, and R has a pole. I'm conscious of how much or little time I have at s equals 1. So as, as was pointed out pretty forcefully in uh, Bob's paper with uh, uh, Chiao and uh, Ed Frankel and also in his earlier paper on beyond endoscopy that you can't even consider this problem until you get something smaller than this. Namely, uh, you get rid of the contribution of these other representations because these are like, um, you're, you're asking uh, to identify very, very subtle, uh, um, um, let's say frequencies, very subtle frequencies in here for the, for some of the, especially some of the representations in there that come from small functorial images of smaller groups. So you're kind of listening for vibrations in there. And these things, trying to do it when these things are there, like trying to do it when there's, so when, when there's a jackhammer outside. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. So, so you're saying that the non-tempered representations all occur outside the cluster. Right? I am. That's, that's, that's not Romanujian conjecture. Um, I'm saying. Um, um, no, I think not. Remember, we've got a we've got a uh, we've got a classification of these yes. by Muglin and Walsperger, and they're in, GLN, yes. yes, we're talking about GLN. Yes, yes. yeah. That's right. So I, I recall that part of what Bob's uh, um, suggestion is that in the process of proving functoriality, you also prove Ramanujan uh, conjecture for these guys. All right. So, uh, so I got to say then, first, before you can even consider this, first uh, try to identify um, explicitly, not just partially, but explicitly, uh, the contribution um, to the uh, geometric part, the regular elliptic terms. Um, of um, the representations pi in pi discrete g minus the cuspidal ones. And then what you have to do, and then you've, you've got to subtract that and look at what's left over on the geometric side. Otherwise, as I say, you're trying to uh, listen to something that's very subtle and very quiet when there's 
jackhammer uh, just outside your window. You can't do that. That's impressionistic. The, the uh, technical explanation is that there's going to be poles uh, uh, of these other representations to the right of the real part of S equals 1, and uh, you can't even uh, then consider the kind of uh, estimates that would come from moving the contour further to the left until you get rid of those guys. All right, so I'm going to I, I, I'm going to make a simplification. This one has to, this simplification is the simplest possible way to consider this, and this has to be solved. It seems to be you, I think you have to solve this first, and so this is I'm following again beyond endoscopy uh, from Langlands and also the con what L2 considered. So let's just keep it very simple. We'll make uh, the function f, the test function f, unramified away from the Archimedean place. So I'm going to fix a prime p. Uh, I'm going to fix a positive integer n. And I'm going to set f equal to an Archimedean function and uh, away from the Archimedean places function. So f infinity is a smooth function of compact support in Z plus, Z plus, GR. And uh, F infinity is then, um, so at 1 prime P, we'll take something a little bit bigger than the basic function that uh, Chow talked about, um, the very sp special case of the spa uh, basic function one that uh, allows for uh, HECA operators um, plus a product of uh, the usual units at the other primes. So FQ. So this is, this is supposed to be the characteristic function uh, in the p-adic uh, general linear, the q-adic general linear group of GL n plus 1, ZQ. And uh, this is something a little bit slightly more complicated, the characteristic function um, of the set. It's going to be contained in the general linear group, but let's say the set of n plus 1 by n plus 1 matrices with integral coefficients, p-adic integral coefficients, whose determinant has p-adic absolute value. Uh, equal to p to the minus k. And then I think that really, even though it looks sort of na so it looks simple in retrospect, but a really fundamental idea which came from the proof of the fundamental lemma uh, and was emphasized in this paper, Frankel Langlands. <coughs> No. Um, these regular semi-simple conjugacy classes gamma in G, uh, general linear group, um, parametrize um, classes gamma uh, in gamma elliptic regular G. Um, by their characteristic polynomial. So, So let me write that as p sub gamma. This is a class gamma in here. I'm going to write it as p sub gamma lambda um, um, equals p sub a um, 
I'll say what a is in a moment, p sub a of lambda. Um, well, a are the coefficients of its characteristic polynomial, lambda to the n plus 1 minus a1 lambda to the n, and so on, plus minus 1 to the n, a1, plus minus 1 to the n plus 1, a n plus 1. So uh, the coefficients then are um, uh, a vector. Um, um, so uh, this is a bijection. Uh, regular semi-simple conjugacy class gets mapped into this uh, collection of coefficients. And so uh, it's uh, one, this is uh, I think in this exact example, this is due to uh, Vladimir McDuffie and Olga Tarski Kostner. Really? Really? All right. OK. The classification of yeah. the conjugacy classes in GLNZ uh, in terms of the character. OK. Well, I'm thinking of just using it in, in, this tra in the trace formula. Um, Certainly, GL2, this is <laughs> yeah. all the time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. GLN is the theorem. All, okay. all right. Um, one has to keep a little bit care of these coefficients. So I'm going to write it as b. I'm going to take the first n of them as b. And the last one is a n plus 1. So um, um, these, the b's uh, can be arbitrary rational numbers. But the uh, a n plus 1 um, has to be non-zero, of course, because it's a determinant. And uh, I just note that um, we've taken a very special function here. And um, with this function up there, if the orbital integral of f uh, of gamma is not 0 um, uh, for f equals f infinity, f upper infinity, upper infinity as above, um, and um, gamma is the preimage of b a n plus 1, um, then first of all b is integral. And second of all, um, a n plus 1, by the nature of the function, um, is going to have determinant. Uh, I'm talking about the, uh, arc, the p-adic uh, uh, absolute value up there. So the Archimedean absolute value will be the inverse of that. Uh, so that's going to be uh, plus or minus, um, um, uh, in fact, this will be plus or minus p to the k. Sorry? Uh, no, no, it's plus because of the product formula for valuations. It turns out this is, this is the Archimedean absolute value. But yeah. So in other words, PA of lambda is a very uh, familiar kind of object. It's an irreducible. So uh, to be uh, regular over Q means that the characteristic polynomial is irreducible. So it's an irreducible monic um, integrable polynomial, I integral polynomial, I integral, pol uh, integral polynomial such that the last term equals has absolute value p to the k. So those, of course, were things that people loved to study 150 years ago. Uh, and as a matter of fact, it, it, uh, you, you, you kind of wonder whether this might be related to a theory, uh, ultimately have relations to the old-fashioned theory of equations. What with invariants and resolvents and things of that nature. Uh, after all, for example, the discriminant plays a fundamental role, as we'll see in a moment, in the study of these things. Well, the discriminant is a starting point for 
study of theory of equations. So. <laughs> well, uh, uh, um, yes, I, it, I guess it is, yeah. But I mean, there is, uh, I mean, there seem to be things that, a couple of things that look like this might be directly related to some of the concerns that people had did in the last century, uh, two centuries ago. All right, so uh, let me say then, just if, if epsilon e is equal to plus or minus one, just to, let's, uh, let me write, because I want to now be parametrizing uh, the terms in the ge on the geometric side by their characteristic polynomials. Let me write B irreducible epsilon um, n z. So this is like an affine space. Um, and this is going to be the set of um, n plus 1 tuples A b epsilon p to the k, um, such that b is a member, b is an integer, an n tuple of integers, and um, um, p um, a of lambda is irreducible. And then, I um, hope I'm Going, obscuring things by going too fast. So then we can just, uh, if we choose, and it uh, seems to be a good idea, just rewrite the uh, geometric side, the uh, regular elliptic part, as a sum over epsilon, the sum over b in this set, b epsilon irreducible, um, and z. Um, and then I'll, I'll write uh, things down. First, I, I'm going to write f infinity g um, epsilon evaluated at b. I'll say what that is in a moment, a very familiar object. I'm going to then have the vile discriminant, absolute value to the minus 1 half. And then I'm going to have the two things that we had, the volume of gamma and the orbital integral of phi infinity uh, gamma. So now I've kind of written this in terms of the characteristic polynomial b and a, and this in the original uh, uh, conjugacy class uh, formulation. Um, uh, we want to do something to these things. These things have to be uh, dealt with. Uh, before you can put them into, be, be, uh, in a way that's probably better in the original notation gamma. But let me just say over there where uh, gamma um, is the pre image of uh, um, A equals B epsilon P to the K. All right, so this is uh, just exactly the same. I'm going to call this the first formula to work with, but this is exactly what we had before. The only change is this has been written as um, a d gamma, the usual way of normalizing the orbital integral by the uh, square root of the vile discriminant uh, times the orbital integral uh, of f uh, infinity at gamma. So I, I just re, we just remind ourselves there's really this is the vile discriminant, but there's three discriminants uh, around here that uh, need to be considered. Um, so this is the, the this d of gamma is supposed to be the vile discriminant. Uh, 
Um, that's closely related. The, the second discriminant is the discriminant of the polynomial, the P uh, A of lambda. So um, this is equal to the discriminant of P of gamma, or P of A, this characteristic polynomial, um, times a harmless uh, factor, the determinant of gamma, to the minus n. And there's a third determ a discriminant that plays a f really fundamental role in this business. Um, it's the discriminant of the field uh, that uh, is generated by the eigenvalues of gamma. So this is d of gamma. I'm going to write this as d of gamma. And by this, so this is the discriminant of the polynomial, characteristic polynomial p gamma or p a. And this is the discriminant of the field. I'm just going to write the field um, generated by the roots of gamma as e, uh, uh, excuse me, just dis discriminant of e of gamma. So this one um, is equal to. Um, Well, this is as we are as not so much me as I didn't grow up in this tradition, but probably by everybody else <coughs> in the room. This, this, uh, this one is equal to this one times the square of a positive integer. What is that extra equal to? I'm, I'm sorry, I don't understand. What Thanks. Yes, yeah. it was not supposed to be there. <laughs> <laughs> this is equal to an integer s gamma squared times the determinant of gamma to the minus n for some integer s gamma. And all three of those things uh, play a role in what one wants to do. Oh, E gamma. So, so we're dealing with GLN. Right. Maximal tori are uh, anisotropic maximal tori are multiplicative groups of extensions of degree n. Oh, it's just the subalgebra of, of the matrix yeah. generated by gamma. Right. Yes, yes, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I don't want the splitting field. I don't want the splitting field. I just want the field generated right. by sure. one root. Uh, gamma and with some embedding, which is so irrelevant. Pardon me. Yeah. Field well, it's a, yeah, yeah. Splitting field of a characteristic polynomial where you join all the roots. Yeah. That's right. Now let me just say uh, there's some preliminary analysis that one uh, wants to do with this. Um, how should I say this? Um, well, I won't. Um, okay, so I want to consider uh, this is preliminary analysis. So it's, it's analysis towards this uh, examination of this problem of subtracting, uh, well, really of doing anything with this, but in particular, first of all, trying to subtract the bad repre representations of their contributions to the elliptic uh, part of the trace formula. So this, um, this is going to be for, this is complete. This is some preliminary uh, analysis by Langlands and in the paper with uh, Frankel and uh, Cho, and um, also L2. I think you read it all two. All two. Uh, all, the English word all, followed by a space, and the English word two. All two. Really? All two. Okay, all right. a red ribbon tied to a horse's tail, so it doesn't really matter. <laughs> all right. I'll think about that after my <laughs> lecture's over.
Um, so uh, AL2 had, com had um, complete analysis uh, for G equals GL2. As an error the G is in Erdogan. Oh, it is. Okay. All right. Thanks. Can, I'm going to make a note of that. If, <laughs> if I can just pause. Well, um, so I'm going to describe. I want to take. Uh, I want to take a moment to describe what was done by Al Two. Al Two. Al Two. Is that right? Al Two. Al Two. All right. All right. Al Two. Al Two difficult. Al Two easy. All right. So, so the, vol the volume is equal to the discriminant of the field to absolute value to the one half, and then L of one d gamma over two. This is the um, class number formula. This is the Kronecker symbol. And this, of course, is a quadratic L function um, uh, over the rational numbers. So this is the sum of that. And then this, uh, there's a formula for this, which in Apparently, it seems to have occurred in a number of guises, but perhaps uh, Langlands, Langlands proved it in the context we want, namely in terms of p-adic orbital integrals. And uh, the formula is, this is the product over so uh, this uh, integer here that uh, distinguishes the um, discriminant of the polynomial from the discriminant uh, of the field. And it's the product over divisors f of this um, integer times s, a product then over all primes that divide this integer, q divides f, lq, 1, d gamma. And so this is the same as this l function, except it's the local component at q. And this is taken to the minus first. This is the inverse of that. So it's just a, a monomial uh, in, at s, but we're talking about it in 1 here. Langlands proved this in by a very fast, brisk argument in the B. No, this is the beyond endoscopy paper. Um, this seems to be absolutely critical. I don't know that I really understand this properly, but this, the generalization of this seems absolutely critical for higher rank. And uh, I'm, I'm, it's conceivable that there are some ideas for dealing with it, but I cause me anyway a lot of trouble. Um, there are lots of formulas, I, I mean a, a significant collection of formulas for p adic orbital integrals for p bigger than 2. The most uh, uh, comprehensive by far are due to Walzberger, where he has an algorithm for calculating p adic orbital integrals for general linear groups. Um, and uh, as long as the, uh, let's say, uh, elliptic p adic orbital integrals, as long as the field uh, E gamma is uh, at most tamely ramified. The problem is formulas, formulas of Kotwitz for GL3, uh, formulas for by Repka for GL3. Um, um, all of those formulas, um, none of them are in this form. And you want a formula that is in this particular form. And you want this not just in this particular form, but you want it to have some other uh, nice properties too. And it's, I'm, sure it's, I'm sure it's there, but I haven't been able to see exactly what it is. Yes. That yes. It's understood quite generally. All right, all right. So maybe I'll. Yeah, yeah. So perhaps we can talk about it. All right. Uh, I don't. Uh, so so uh, so here was the here was a basic question asked by 
uh, Frankel, Langlands, and Go. There's my formula. That's formula one. And it's a sum over b. Well, it's basically, it's not quite, but it's basically a lattice. That's at b, uh, b, that space b is uh, over z, z is z to the n. Now, it's, uh, basically, it's irreducible polynomials, not all polyn characteristic polynomials, but nonetheless, it's very much like the sum of some things over a lattice. Now, that function f infinity g, that's a function uh, on the real points of that vector space. And it's smooth everywhere except where the, determinant, the discriminant is 0. So um, Altug actually had a very nice way of correcting it so that it was smooth. Altu, Altu had a nice way of correcting it. And um, with. Uh, you can teach yourself to say Z, you can teach yourself to say Altu. <laughs> I learned to say Z when I was in graduate school. It's, uh, I, I was young and uh, teachable at that, at that state. <laughs> So the question is, can you apply uh, uh, so you got I'm going to pretend that uh, f infinity of b is a, a Schwartz function. It's close to being a Schwartz function. You've got a sum over the values of that Schwartz function in what is close to a lattice, and it was a very natural question for them to ask, can you apply plus on summation? Um, to the sum over um, b in uh, this uh, set. The answer, uh, uh, so this is a question. The answer was by all, all two uh, in. Oh, Oh, yes, OK, Ali. Uh, this is in, only in the case g equals gl2. And the answer is yes, but only after uh, some very, uh, uh, I think, surprising, interesting um, number theory and analysis. I'm not you. This is not part of my DNA. But this, uh, after very interesting analysis, he showed that it was true. And I'm going to, I, uh, how much time do I have? About 10 minutes. 10 minutes. Um, I'm going to. The advantage of being less speaker is you can forget all this. Thank you. <laughs> uh, but you might get shot. <laughs> OK. Oh, yeah, that's right. I, I, I'm in the United States. <laughs> Um, no, just, yeah. just kidding. Um, so the final answer is, let's call this formula 2. Um, this elliptic regular term, this expansion up there, is indeed equal to a sum over uh, elements. Well, we're talking about GL2, so we're talking uh, about a lattice, uh, a one-dimensional lattice, just Z. Um, I elliptic regular um, um, F at C. So it is a sum of Fourier transforms um, over, um, uh, over this lattice, but it's complex. First of all, that bar means not the original thing, but something that's uh, close to the original thing, but um, is, uh, differs from it. This is only after adding um, values of f infinity, epsilon g, uh, um, uh, B at places B in B um, one Z, which is just Z minus 
uh, what we were really supposed to be considering, the ones, the n plus 1 tuples, whose characteristic polynomial is irreducible. So what sort of a density are you looking at? It's it's the ones. Uh, it's the ones. These integral coefficients. <coughs> we're dealing with GL one here, just Z. It's it's such that uh, gam b squared is b uh, is not a square. B is not a square. So I don't know what, quite what density that would be, but it's, it seems pretty thin to me. Um, so uh, one Z. Um, why are we, first of all, why are we doing that? Well, we want something that's a sum over a lattice. Um, what good is it? Well, it seems to be, my guess is it's close to what you would get if you included the supplementary geometric terms in the trace formula. They're not the, quite the same as this, but anyway, it's probably related. Um, here, So I, I, I think it's important to say what this is because it is a complex <coughs> object um, and uh, maybe gives us a little bit of an idea of what we're up against uh, even after a se successful uh, re resolution by Ali of that question. Well, let me, I'll write it down. So where so where the sum and i bar hat elliptic regular uh, f of c is equal to the following expression. So I'm saying it's a Fourier transform of f infinity of b. <coughs> well, that's not quite the case. Um, it's a sum over epsilon equals plus or minus 1 and an integral over r of f infinity g epsilon of x. OK, so looks like a Fourier transform so far. We've got an exponential e to the 2 pi i um, x dot c. But there's some extra stuff. It's not just a Fourier transform of this. It's a convolution of two Fourier transforms, namely Fourier transform of this and some rather explicit function. Or to put it another way, it's a Fourier transform of the product of this with some other explicit function, j, f, l, and x. And then this isn't quite that. It's a rescaling re, uh, of that lattice. This is the, the uh, oh, I've got to put something else in here. What are these variables, f and l? This is not just a supplementary function of x. But it's a function of x that depends on two additional parameters, positive integers f and l. And then, as a matter of fact, there, are, there is a 1 over so fq. You have two f's in the equation, don't you? Because, well, yeah, the 1 is an integer, the 1 is a function. <laughs> ah, yes, that's, that's, yes. Uh, this is f1 and this is f2. But uh, Your advisor can get away with that, but I don't think we're going to let you do it. <laughs> Uh, I don't. I didn't want to use f in the first place, but everybody's using <laughs> f there. So, uh, so this is one over f cubed. I don't know why f was used, but it's one over f cubed, one over l squared. This function depends on l and f. Uh, this is something that's left over from the formula, uh, which I've rubbed off. This is from the p-adic orbital integrals. If you remember, there was a, a sum over f in the p at q adic orbital integrals. This is the sum that's the Dirichlet series. It's a very remarkable formula to my um, thinking. Um, so it's a, it's a, it's the sum uh, of uh, the Dirichlet. What, what is the exponent on the f in your sum? E to the 2 pi i. It's a 3. No, it's a, oh. three. It's a 3. This is one, at 1 over, yes, 1 over f cubed, 1 over l squared. Those oh, come in. F, f cubed? Yep. Yep. Okay. Um, what does it mean, f cubed? Pardon me? What does it mean? Well, f's a positive integer. <laughs> as well as so what does the 2 have to do with it? 
uh, two and three. Is this a, a subscript or superscript? No, no, L squared, one over L squared, uh -huh. one over L squared, and one over F cubed. Cubed. Yeah, <laughs> one over f cubed, and they come in in, in a change of variables that come in the process of deriving this. Um, so this comes. So this comes from the Dirichlet series. This comes from this. What you are going to say, uh, epsilon is equal to plus or minus one. What are you? What this Dirichlet series does not converge. So you can't be putting uh, that in there. Uh, you don't want conditional convergence. All of this has to be absolutely convergent. Uh, yes. So uh, this uh, Al Al Ali uses the approximate func functional equation. So this is uh, it, it puts in an explicit function. Um, in X, which tames the difficulties, the, the singularities of this, but also tames the singularities in this sum here. Um, and then finally, this is not, this, there's a minor rescaling of this lattice. It's e to the 2 um, L F squared, and uh, then integrated with respect to X. And then one further uh, complication, it's not just the sum of these Fourier transforms, but it's a linear combination of these Fourier transforms with a arith very arithmetic kind of function, f a k l f um, c epsilon p to the k. And this is a Klusterman-like sum. I'm sorry. <laughs> So uh, can I remove one of these O's? Do you mind if I remove <laughs> one of these O's? <laughs> double O, double O, next O. Clusterman like, looks like a German word. Uh, Clusterman sum. OK, thank you. But all those things are on the same line. <laughs> these ones. Yeah, yeah. Yes, this is his formula. Th this is his formula. I, I just want to make sure the K is a little low. Uh, yeah, no, no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. This is, this is. Uh, times K. Yes, that comes outside the Fourier transform. And so, you know, this is, this is, this, a lot of the arithmetic content seems to have been gone into this. And these are all the things that uh, have analytic content. So, in an analyzing this, uh, this is crucial. All right. Um, So uh, the second question, I won't uh, go too much longer, but the second question that was posed in this paper um, was then, uh, all right, you've got uh, the, the imp I think the motivation was uh, you're putting in, by doing a Fourier transform in this, an additive Fourier transform, you're putting in another, uh, you're putting a spectral variable, a kind of spectral variable into the geometric side. And so if there's going to be some contribution of spectral terms to the geometric side, you're better, you have a better chance of seeing them. Uh, I mean, so the thinking goes um, if you can express the geometric side in terms of some spectral-like variables. And so the question was, uh, can you identify <coughs> uh, the contribution? Um, of the representations pi in pi discrete g minus pi uh, 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 cuspidal ones, the cuspidal ones you want to keep, um, to now we're talking about this formula um, um, 2 there, the 2. And the answer is by Ali. Yes? yes. And a beautiful answer, an answer that was, uh, he talked about it actually, uh, an answer that was uh, conjectured, in fact, in this paper. The, the trivial uh, representation, the most non tempered of the discrete spectrum, um, con it was conjectured here that it should correspond, even in general, to the term. So what do you want to guess? What term is it going to correspond to up there if you 
well, you probably already know, that it's a sum over C and Z. What term would the? All right. So, <laughs> yes, uh, it's the term I bar hat zero, uh, F zero. It's the term with C equal to zero. Um, and there were two. There are two representations there. Yeah, there's there's the trivial uh, one-dimensional representation that's highly non-tempered. But as Ali mentioned in his talk, there's another one too, namely something from the discrete part of the trace formula that's not in the discrete spectrum. Uh, that the uh, induced representation corresponding to the trivial inducing character. And he showed that both of those together uh, basically exhaust this term. Not, they not only contribute to it, they exhaust it, modulo uh, an error term that uh, appears to be uh, well behaved and not to interfere with the kind of estimates that you want to do from then on. So uh, what do you want me to do? You want me to stop? OK. So I have a conjecture, a lovely conjecture. Uh, well, <laughs> it's maybe false. I have a nice conjecture for uh, GLN. And in fact, it, uh, part of what uh, makes it plausible to me is that it has an even nicer uh, general analog. And I'm just going to write three, th uh, three things um, which seem to be hap something that's happening in general. So this G is general. But let's say split and simply connect it. And then the, um, uh, uh, OK. So we've got two kinds of spectral parameters. We've got the dual group. And so uh, spectral parameters, uh, so two kinds of spectral parameters. Uh, on the dual group, well, one kind um, are mappings uh, psi from the, uh, say, hypothetical global Langlands group cross SL2C into G hat. That's one kind of spectral parameter. Those are the things that we hope will parameterize automorphic representations or packets of them. And over here, well, I guess we've just got elements C in, uh, I'm going to write the affine space in which these uh, things occur. Uh, so that SL2C is your SL2C, not the SL2C. Yes, it's the global SL2C. And I'm going to write C for the um, affine space um, of n dimensions, uh, but I'm going to write it as C to indicate it's the, the dual thing. OK, so this would come in if you could do uh, Poisson summation in general. All right, so we've got unipotent conjugacy classes. That's what's <laughs> happening over there. Uh, class, uh, and you're going to want to classify these things. So classification of Bala and Carter of unipotent conjugacy classes. And uh, where they're going to appear over here is the classification of Dinkin by weighted Dinkin diagrams of unipotent classes. <coughs> so I don't have time to say explicitly what that is. And then one uh, really quite intriguing thing, and I have I'm sort of figured out exactly what conjecturally this all should be, but over here we've got abelian class field theory. And the way uh, that, so that'd be something that's happening over there, maybe when the image of LF is abelian. Uh, that's got to be reflected in something that's happening over here. And what seems to be the case is it's Kummer theory. What? Kummer theory. I did, don't tell me I pronounced that wrong. <laughs> 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 
which is something that I think Bob has emphasized. That it's, of course, it's not what really what you're looking. The, I don't understand the headings of your columns. So what, what are the two different categories? Well, we are asking the question as to how you would identify the exceptional representations in the discrete part of the trace formula, how you're going to identify their contributions to the elliptic side. A and we're saying that you can, hoping that you can get a Poisson summation formula that will write the elliptic side in terms of... You're not answer, what, what are the titles to your columns? Um, uh, uh, there actually are no titles. These are all supposed to be equivalent to each. Uh, these are all sort of part of the same general phenomenon. Yes, but how does Lincoln's diagram differ all that much from the Le Carter that I understand? Oh, it does. It's a different class, a totally different class. They are both equi they are equivalent classifications of unipotent conjugacy classes, but they're quite different. Uh, Bala Carter is the generalization of the Jordan normal form. Uh, the Dinkin classification parameterizes unipotent conjugacy classes as uh, um, dense orbits of, of unipotent radicals of parabolic subgroups. For, for GLN, you can you can take. Jordan normal form as blocks, uh, and then but you can t then take the dual uh, blocks, and that parameterizes. You're thinking of, of okay, uh, no, never mind. Some kind of so, so in your GL two example that Ali has done, I'll say Ali. Yes. 